Isaiah uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Pastor Paul, bring us the book. Mm. Amen. <clears throat> Verses 10 through 15, as you heard Greg reading those verses, was last week's preaching text. And you see, there is levied a serious indictment against the house of Judah. Uh, that will eventually, it would be several kings later, but it won't be long, where the nation will be charged for their unacceptable worship before God. What is the answer, however? Where, where do we go whenever a charge is levied against us of unacceptable worship? Do we just ignore it and continue on as normal? Oh, because the previous generation did it this way, so uh, if it was all right for them to do it, it surely must be okay for us. And so we continue on without giving question or without giving ear, or which could be the case, or it could even be so, as A.W. Tozer puts it, that most Christians really don't hear God and the primary reason that they don't hear God is because they've already decided that they don't want to do what God has said. This is, this is an indictment that requires an answer, and an answer that we must go to God for and seek His face. As you saw in verse number 10, you remember from our, our previous times together, there's this plea, if you will, to hear the word of the Lord. There's this Plead, give ear to the instructions of the Lord. So let's do that. What are the words that the Lord would give us as an answer to this problem of unacceptable worship? And it's where we come to the answer in verses 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, where he concludes, truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So hear the word of the Lord. Give ear to his instruction today. Surely, truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So verse 16, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Now, if you've given yourself to the meditation of the text, you're going to find that your preacher is really not all that clever at all. He doesn't have a better outline than to go with the text. And so every point of the text, or every point of the sermon today, comes from nearly every line of the Scripture text, from verses 16 through 20. Again, as you, as you think of this, in relationship to the previous verses, verses 10 through 15, 
The instruction here, the word from, from the Lord, the, that which comes from the mouth of the Lord says this. The instruction is this. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Well, well we're going to have to be really careful with this text, aren't we? Because you, you already know that there is a danger that lays here. Are, are you implying and is Isaiah suggesting and is the mouth of God giving instruction that we can somehow clean ourselves? independent and apart from the work of Christ? Well, the answer is, on the front end, is an obvious no. And it's an emphatic no. It's a no with an exclamation point at the end of it. It's not, a, it's not up for question here. This cleaning of ourselves is a work that God does, and we'll let the flow of the text bring it out. We'll let the, really the conclusion down toward verses 18, 19, and 20 will bear as much evidence for this as the whole of Scripture does. Obviously, from the very first sin that is committed, you think of Adam and Eve in the garden. They've eaten the forbidden fruit, and there in the cool of the day, God and where God and man would walk together. And God is not like He's perplexed and He's, he's confused as to where they are. He's calling them out. And they've done something. They've clothed themselves. And as you recall from Genesis in the early pages, this clothing of themselves was unacceptable to God. The kind of clothing, the kind of covering that is required for the sins of men is a work that God does. It is a work that involves man obeying and man doing what God instructs him to do but the doing of these instructions is not what gets your salvation. This is from the other side of this where salvation has come to us that there are instructions of obedience to the one whom God has put His name upon. So that's the placement here. That's the instructions that are here are not words of how to be saved. Go, and, go from here and go out and improve yourselves and get yourselves better and somehow clean up yourselves and get, get, get the grime and get the, the dirt off of you and then come back and present yourself as clean. No, this is a clean that is outside of ourselves. But the instruction here is that as God has shown us that what we've been presenting to Him is unacceptable to Him, and that what we've cleaned up and what we've washed up and even brought to Him in a cleaned up bowl, as you would find Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 23, those who have, they're, not, they're no better than, or they're no different than whitewashed tombs. On the outside, clean, but on the inside, defiled. This is the kind of presentation that verses 10 through 15 represents is a people who have presented their actions appropriately and rightly in mode, but filthy from their heart. And their intent is unclean. And so that's why Isaiah gives the double instruction in verse 10 to hear the word of the Lord or to give ear to the instructions of the Lord. Here's the problems with you. I, I, I'm tired. I'm fed up. I'm sick. I reject all of this worship that you're doing. But now, let me instruct you here. This washing, this cleaning, is a clean that comes from the inside that I give to you. Wash yourselves with this blood. Wash yourselves or clean yourselves with this. You notice the very last thing in verse 15 in the indictment where, where the Lord says to the nation of Israel, to the house of Judah, that your hands are covered with blood. That is an indication at this level they were still doing things according to the instructions that they received from God through Moses, through Aaron, and that the priest had continued to instruct the nation to do for in their worship of God. They've been active in it. But look, they're stained. Look, they, they are. They have, they have guilt upon them because they've not done this in the proper heart. Their hearts have not been circumcised. Their flesh has been circumcised, but their hearts are not circumcised. They're not clean. They've not been removed from the filth of their sin. 
This washing of yourselves, this making of yourselves clean comes with the word repent. It comes with this mandate that you must stop. You must remove. You must cease from this. And that's the language of the following verses or the following statements in the following verses. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. In this very first thing he says after the washing is that what are you to do? You are to remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Now this is important. Some, for some reason and for some, some it's, it's not for lack of truth, but perhaps it's a lack of consistent and persistent preaching from pulpits across the land. And that is that there is no place that you can go that you're out of God's sight. But somehow, many inside of Christendom have convinced themselves that they can do things that God cannot see. And they behave in such a way that their sins are private. And so, as we even addressed in these previous verses, that we think, well, it's a private sin and it doesn't affect anybody and it doesn't bother anyone else. So, What's the, what's the harm in it? The harm is that you're committing it in the sight of God. And that is the offense. It's not that you're doing it in private or you're, you're doing it in public. That's not what declares something vile before God or not. What declares it vile before God is that it's done in His sight. So wash yourselves and clean yourselves. Or make yourselves clean. Here's the instructions. The blood of Christ lays over you. The, the, the declarations of your sin have been covered, but now are the instructions. Sinner who's repented of your sins, you must now remove the sin, remove the evil of your deeds. It's not just stopping one day and deciding to pray a prayer. This is a work that requires active attention to it. So you're to remove the evil of your deeds from God's sight. So whether it's in private or in public, bearer of the name of Christ, cease, stop, remove the evil deeds from the sight of God. Cease to do evil. Sounds like, this, like, like, like remove the evil of your deeds. It is removing it. But you know the, you know the case. In, in the New Testament where we hear about this strong man who comes and, and overcomes a home. In a parable, Jesus gives this teaching that one day you decide that you want to clean the house. You want to clean your body. You want to get rid of all of the, the filth from the home. And so you clean the house. You sweep it clean. You remove everything from it. You, you've done all that the law has instructed you in it. But you've not given attention to this important thing. And that is, in your removal of all of the things, which was good to do, you did nothing to set yourself up to cease, to stop from doing evil. All you've done is you've made the room, you've made the house, you've made the body clean for a moment so that, as Jesus would tell the parable, the, the, the evil spirits that have been cleaned out of the home, they go and they find seven other stronger, bigger, meaner, more vile evil spirits and they come in and they overtake that strong man who cleaned his house. And you know this is the case even you, you yourself it bears witness that this is true in your own life. How many times do we, do we stop and we say I don't want to be like this any longer. I know it's wrong. I know it's offensive to God and so let's clean it out. Let's, let's make the place livable again for the Holy Spirit to be present and and, and, and to be worshipped in this body, in this temple that belongs to the Lord. But you have not ceased from doing evil. And so the next moment that you give enticement to sin, it comes in like a flood, doesn't it? You know this is true. I don't have to... I, I'm not telling you something that you haven't already personally experienced. We know this to be true. And so this word to cease to do evil, it again implies this, this walking with the Lord is not something that is done passively. It is done with serious attention. 
to cease to do something, it has with it the instructions. This is an action. This isn't just a, I throw my hands up and cease. No, I have to push myself away from the table. I must cease. I must stop. I must no longer do that which I previously was blinded in and loved to do that was offensive to God. Well, the next part of, the very, of, the, of, of verse 17, we're instructed to learn to do good. And we'll give some, some, some additional applications to all of this along the way, but learn to do good. And this is kind of the general, and then the following things in verse 17 are specifics inside of learn to do good. But let's at least acknowledge this. The instruction is learn to do good. It gives it, it comes with the, with the implication that we don't know how to do good. And this is biblical. It fits the biblical model. Paul himself says there is none righteous. No, not even you who are sitting there in your self-righteous mind. Not even you are good. And so this is something that is not part of our of our natural born estate. Now yes, you can do things that are good for other people, but you also will know this when we come to the text in Isaiah, that our good deeds, our, our actions done in self-righteousness, they are good, they, are, they, would be, they would appear to be good amongst fellow journey, journeyers along the way, but in relationship to the holiness of God, they are like filthy rags. There is none who are righteous. There is none that are good. And so the instruction here is to learn to do good. How do we learn to do good? I think that's a good question. And I think it's a question if you're not asking yourself, then probably you're letting some other instruction come into your life that is not righteous, is not good. Learn to do good. In, invest yourself in the study of God's Word. Invest yourself in sitting at the table with other believers. Young people, invest time in, in seasoned journeyers with the Lord. Invest time with other, other followers of Christ. Not just with people that you have similar likes and you have similar interests and similar hobbies. Invest yourself in a multicultural, multi-generational fellowship of believers. Can, can that be accomplished one hour a week? I, I, I don't think it can sufficiently be accomplished. I think there's benefit to learn to do good that you would be involved in Bible studies. Do they have to be at the church house? Oh no, but they're intentional. That, that in your, to the young people, in your young life, there would be benefit that you would desire to want to sit down with someone who's journeyed through life and ask them pointed questions. Find out from them, how did you overcome sin in your own life? If they're not willing to talk to you about that, then find someone who's at peace to talk about how God has helped them to overcome sin in their life. Let it be of aid to you. Let it be help to you. Learn here to do good. Find out opportunities in your church that you can involve yourself and in, get yourself engaged in doing good things. Now, be careful in this because it won't take long that you will substitute a, a holy, righteous desire to know who God is. You'll substitute that with a bunch of activity. And a lot of people in churches today are very busy doing a lot of things for other people. And we can say at a level that that is a common grace that God would give to all of humanity. But if we're not careful, we won't be far removed from a people who are identified in verses 10 through 15 that God is displeased with their activity. Strangely, they're doing good things, but they have no interest in knowing who God is. Guard yourself against this church. Don't just, 
Don't just go find out all the good things you can do and avoid and, and miss out on good Bible study and seeking the face of God and knowing who God is and praying with other believers and seeking the face of God on behalf of, of yourself and behalf of a, of a local church, on behalf of a community, on behalf of the missionary cause. Do not avoid those things that will seem as though they are quite boring. If you do not understand the benefit of them, you will have no desire to want to learn this. Learn to do good. Now specifically, one could see that, the, that Isaiah breaks it down in, in, in four specific ways. I do not, I, do not, I think that, that these are, even in their specifics, they are still quite broad. Uh, to seek justice. To seek justice. This is not just something relegated to legalities or uh, civil legal proprieties of, of what we would do uh, that are obeying the law, seeking justice. Uh, it, 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 it is that, but it's not just that. It, it, it involves you being a law-abiding citizen for the sake of the glory of God that you would be a desire to follow the laws of the land so long as those laws don't put you in position to deny the name of Christ. But the common laws of man, it would be right that you, learning to do good, would seek to justly live civically amongst each other. You would seek justice. Now this does not mean that you need to stop whatever you're doing and enter yourself into law school uh, and go and, and, and so that you can seek justice on those who do illegal things. It certainly still implies that the church in a community ought to be a voice of truth, which is Paul's argument to Timothy. You be in this community a pillar and a buttress of truth. Seek justice here. When you hear that injustices are being done in the city, the church ought to have a voice in this. And the church ought to be involved in it. But be careful here. Because the next thing you know, you, seek, you, you cease learning to do good for the sake of knowing who God is and you engage yourself as an activist. You, you see not the benefit of worshiping God. You lose the emphasis of reading His Word. You, 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 see, you, you cease having any desire to fellowship with believers. You, you, you even get to the point as an activist, as an, as an imbalanced activist, as thinking that the church work is so elementary that you don't need to gather with the saints on the Lord's Day. You don't need to pray together. You don't need to study the Word together. What really needs to happen is you need to join me out on the picket line and we need to make sure that everyone in the community knows that injustice is being done here. The community needs to hear that what happens at this office or what happens at this facility, what happens at this location is an act against the will of God is an act, even an, an act of aggression against humanity. Certainly, the community needs to hear this, but never at the sake of a people who forget their God. And this was the problem of verses 10 through 15. And so for Isaiah to say these things, they were certainly resonated with the people because they, 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 they desired to do this, but purely from the activist position and not from that of a, an ambassador of the reconcilia reconciliation of God. So you would seek justice. Learn to do good by seeking justice. Learn to do good by reproving the ruthless. Now again, there's, there's, there are some specifics here and this also is best if we keep this as broad as possible. What are the ruthless, the vile, the, the, the arrogant, the stubborn, the stiff-necked? These are those who do what they do irregardless of truth. In our day, as is every day, 
the church must reprove ruthless activity. From something as simple as, as graffiti in a neighborhood house. We ought to reprove that. We ought to stand for this, stand against this. But listen, you, you see the danger that exists here. It won't take long that we'll, we'll, we'll feel compelled to organize a committee to go out and clean up all graffiti in the town. And the next thing you know, we're using all of our money, we're using all of our energy. Everyone's exhausted and tired because as soon as you clean something up, somebody's a day behind you to rewrite on it. How do we engage in that in a proper way, in a helpful way? We, we must be a voice in the community for truth. We must be in the community a voice for God, reproving the ruthless. Speaking against the atrocities that are done against humanity, illegal activity, the trafficking of humans, the aborting of our babies, we must speak into this ruthless activity. We must be a voice that speaks back to the nation, that speaks back to the neighborhood, that speaks to the, civil, to the civic leaders in our community. That irregardless of how man wants to identify marriage, the, the ordered creation of God's universe is male and female. We must reprove the ruthless. Now that's risky. That's dangerous. That's why I think that we need to hear this. Because we are not the kind of people who, who will voluntarily sign ourselves up for difficult things. Which, which makes the prosperity gospel so popular. The prosperity gospel is simply this. You come to Jesus and your bank account will get rich. You come to Jesus and your marriage will get better. You come to Jesus and we'll teach you how to have a happy family. You come to Jesus, just go ahead and come to Jesus and, 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 and your vehicle is going to start running all the time again. Just go ahead and come to Jesus and all of your grades are going to improve. Come to Jesus. See, that's, everybody wants to go to that kind of Jesus. But who wants to come to a Jesus who's going to require of you to obey Him. Who's going to say, follower of mine, hear my instructions. Learn to do good. Seek justice. And be a voice. And reprove the ruthless. Now we understand that to reprove the ruthless does not give us permission to be ruthless ourselves. We must never put down the megaphone of compassion. We must never put down the net of hope. We must never set aside the gospel and pick up the, the clip, pick up the baseball bat and be ruthless ourselves. Reprove the roof, the ruthless, and we'll get we'll get some reasoning to this in verses eighteen. In verse 18, and then we'll get to two if-then statements in 19 and 20, but two more matters in, the, in a category of learning to do good. And that is that you would defend the orphan and that you would plead for the widow. Now these two things are brought up in James chapter 1. True and undefiled religion is this. It's actually three-part, not just two-part. As we, 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 we are so... We, 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 we genuinely, generally speaking, we like to pick an easy part or a lovable part out of a verse and ignore the difficult part. <laughs> Not that caring for the orphan and the widow in their day of distress is an easy thing. Uh, it's a God-ordered thing. In church, you must do this work. You must do it locally and you, not, and you must do it abroad. We can't just sit back and say, well, we've, we fulfill this work 
because we have a bulletin board in the, in the lobby out here that shows us that we are defenders of the orphans. Well, we can bless the Lord for that, but we must never sit back in a rocking chair and be satisfied that we've done all that's required of us. Now, right now, you know that, that God, in His kindness, has given us an enormous responsibility for the care of... I. We had four new girls at the home this week. I think, and don't, don't quote me on this, but I think we now have 61 girls in the home. I don't know. Well, I, I hope to be there in November. I've I, I got to see this place. Defend the orphan. And you know that Erlandia has been severely on the verge of death. And God has, in His sovereignty, given you the privilege of a hard work to care for that precious little girl in her great need. Oh, you may not know this, but Erlandia is home. Uh, she's not completely healed. She's not able to walk yet. She needs physical therapy. And by the grace of God, that'll all get worked out along the way. But a great homecoming took place this week when Erlandia came home from the hospital for the first time since June. What a blessed work that God has given to you. Now, we don't even know how much it's going to cost yet for the medical care that she's had to take and do. But we will bless the Lord for how He will care for it, We'll depend upon Him to do it. We'll wait upon Him to do it. And we'll trust that He will. Our duty is to learn to do good. Defend the orphan. Many of these girls at your home, you, you may not know. We, we may never know the kind of tragedies that all of them have come from. But to give them a safe place in a city that is actively against them, is a kindness of God. And it is a risky work that you've taken on. Because you see, there are people who would love to have all of those girls to be able to do all of the vile, evil things that they want to do. God has given you a serious work, hasn't He? He's called us to this work of the nations of the world. Not, and, and we mustn't Dismiss. We mustn't miss that in our Western culture that there are still orphans in our day. The great tragedy in our day is that the church is pleased to let the government take care of it when it's the church's duty. How, how will, will we just sit back on a rocking chair locally and be pleased that the government takes care of the orphaned needs? Well... Pleading for the widow. Who, who will be a voice for the widow today? Now in this case, and you, you, you likely know widows and they're anything but weak. I have a mother who's anything but weak. Oh, you think she's walking with that cane. Makes her look weak and frail. Oh, she can take care of herself. <laughs> and, and you just need to learn the distance of the cane. No, you don't. No, you don't. She would never intentionally use that against you. But our, th this description here is properly fit upon a very vulnerable portion of the population. There are people who intentionally target old women and old men, but especially old women who, if they can get them scared into thinking they need to buy this or scared into thinking that all of their money has been tapped and if you'll just give them, give them your bank account. By the way, if anyone calls you asking for your bank account number, you should just hang the phone up. That's your public service announcement of the day. as nothing spiritual whatsoever inside of that. But to the church, 
you must plead the case for the widow. Are there things in the city that the city magistrates can do to help our widows? Who will stand for them? Who will speak for them? Who will be a voice for them? Well, may it be those who bear the name of Christ. And may it be a grace to every widow in the city, in the region. Well, verse 18, probably the, f- the most familiar of the passages that we have here in the early portions of Isaiah. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are as scarlet. You remember verse 15? Look back up to verse 15. What does it say about their hands? They are covered with blood. They are stained with sin. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Think for a moment of this. Think of this courtroom scene, because that's essentially what this is. This is, a, this is an image of a courtroom where the judge has, has called in those who are being charged. And, and for him to say, let us reason, he's not saying, let's negotiate a deal. He's saying, listen, let me speak truth to you. Let me expose some things to you. Let me show you the truth in the matter. So this coming together and reason with God is not let's come together and negotiate a deal with God. Come on, God. You mean this this particular craving of mine, I just can't I can't lick it. And so can we come to a compromise? Can we come to some kind of a deal and let's let's draft up a new law that says I I can't do this, but when I do this, that I'm covered and I'm okay. That's not that's not this kind of reasoning. So don't. Don't even go there, and for most all of us, we need to stop thinking that we can reason with God. The judge, the ruler of the universe, has called you into His courtroom, and He's saying to you, come here, let me show you. Let me show you something. Here, do you see this stain of sin upon your hands? I know you you come into the courtroom with your hands behind your back. And the judge says, though your sins are like scarlet, though your, though, your, though your hands are dripping still in the blood of this religious activity that you've been doing and that you've been doing with completely wrong motives, you're guilty of idolatry. You're guilty of sins against your neighbors, but today you're being charged with sins against the high court of heaven. Come now, look at this. Though your sins are scarlet, see, there's, there's even, you could even get the idea that the, the, the judge has brought a graph into the courtroom. And look, here, here is this graph that shows this sin in your life. And on the same graph, this isn't the high part of the graph, this is actually down here at the bottom of the graph. And though your sins are scarlet like this, pay close attention to this. There is a righteousness here. Do you see the standard? Here's you. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be like this. White as snow. Now you look at that difference and you see the discrepancy. The, 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 The blood is dripping from your hands, from your idolatry. You're guilty immediately. There's no hiding the sin that you have. And there the high court of heaven is saying, look, though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. He must be sitting there thinking, how can this be? How is it possible, God? How is it? There you see, there's no hiding here. You can't even refute. You can't even say it's not my fault. It's true. You are. Your sins are dripping on you. They are present. They have stained you. And there the high court of heaven says, they shall be white as snow. How, dear God, how can it be? Look, that's my sin. How can it be that my sins can be covered and be white as snow? But the high court of heaven isn't done yet reasoning. He has another graph to show you. 
It's almost identical to the other one. And this one is, though your sins, though they be red like crimson, though they be just like they are, they shall be white as wool. They shall be wool. There you are in that courtroom of the high God, almighty ruler of the universe, and he's called you into his presence. And he's declaring to you, I have this sin problem of yours covered. How, dear God? I've tried washing my hands. I've gone to the wash basin and every time I wash and 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 look, my hands are still covered with sin. I've done what you've told me to do and I've cleansed myself and I've gone and I've gone through the motions and I've gone through the routines. I've gone to the church house. I've gone to the meeting house. I've listened. I've studied. I've done everything. And look, God, there are my sins still red as scarlet, stained red like crimson. And you're telling me they shall be white as snow and they shall be like wool. How is it possible? This high God speaks further. Then do not get confused here. He is not pleading with you. He's not begging you to do anything. He's invited you into his courtroom and he said, come, let me show you. Here's your sin. You have no, you have no defense. It's true, God. That's, I love to sin. I love to, I love to do that which you forbid. And I do it in your sight. How, dear God, then? If, here comes the first of two if-then statements. Here's the complication. Is that we think that here lays the secret to salvation. If you consent and obey, all of a sudden this sounds like the prosperity gospel, doesn't it? If I will just consent and begin to do the things in the, right made, in the right mode, in the right way, that then I will be able to eat the best of the land. Let's, let's, be, let's exercise caution here to consent. This isn't, this isn't a work that is, that is done unless God opens your eyes. You're not able to repent of your sins unless God opens your eyes, unless God opens your ears. You come into the high court of heaven and there you see a graph and, and the high king of glory points to the red stained sins of your life. And then he talks about his covering them and declaring them holy and righteous and clean. And you stay there in your stubborn, stiff-necked way and you refuse You refuse to repent. If that's the case, then it's simply because God has not opened your ears and opened your eyes to see. But if in this courtroom setting, there you stand, in the weight of what's just been shown to you by, the, by Almighty God, Jehovah, and you just begin to melt because you know the charges are true. Count it a blessing from God that He has opened your eyes. He has opened your ears to hear the Gospel. He's given you all that is needed now to consent and obey. This obeying work does not earn your salvation. This obeying work is because your eyes have been opened and the high court of heaven has shown you you're guilty of sin and the high court of heaven has covered your sins and made them white as snow. You have no other desire but to bless the name of the Lord and obey His name. 
You want to. I mean, look what He did for you. He took your guilty sins that, re- that would justly deserve the pouring out of God's wrath upon you. And He's declared you holy. Oh God, what do you want from me? I'll learn to do good. I'll seek justice. I'll reprove the ruthless. I'll defend the orphan. I'll plead the case for the widow. I do these things not because it may somehow please God or impress God. I do them because He has shown me my sin and He has shown me my Redeemer. But, well, let me finish the then part of verse 19. You will eat the best of the land. It is possible that your life could improve as a result of turning your life to God. But that's not the promises of the Bible. It is true that there are times when God gives financial blessings to His people. When God does so, though, note this, mark this, it's not for your selfish pleasure. It's for His glory. It's for His name. It's for the advancement of the gospel. God would be so kind. If you'll stop and just do a little bit of investigation. In in seasons of times like these kinds of great tragedies and great natural disasters like what has taken place in the Gulf Coast. Listen, the, 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 the human experience itself drives people to want to help other people. You don't have to be a believer. You don't have to be a follower of God. You can be a sin-filled hater of all things righteous and holy and, and still be moved with compassion to help the needs and the plight of your fellow man. But do you know one thing that marks Things that are always, they're not a surprise to me any longer. But they are markers of where God brings great blessings to businessmen, businesswomen, to companies. And if you just do a little investigating here, you're going to find some companies are being very generous. And I'm not trying to belittle godless companies that are doing good in a time like this. But look closely. They're not the ones who are are blowing their own horn. The ones who belong to God are not the ones blowing their own horn. They're the ones who are behind the scenes. They're the ones who are on the front lines. There are, you you get, not all believers are, are the ones who are responding in a time like this. But you will note there is something especially different about those who belong to God. To say that they will eat the best of the land, in this case, as they are satisfied to suffer in this land, while knowing that there is a better promise to come. This is the argument from the writer of Hebrews, essentially. There is a better promise. There is a better sacrifice. There is a better rest. There is a better hope for us. To be in this place and to say that that's a marker, that financial prosperity is a marker of those who consent and obey, then you'd have, you'd have to then have some kind of an answer for those who suffer for the name of Christ in North Korea. What are you going to do and how are you going to answer those who when they call in the name of God in the Arabian Peninsula, their, na- their, their families take them into the desert and you never hear from them again. We, got, we, we can't say that coming to consenting and obeying to God, here's an, here's an automatic, your life is about to get really good. No, your life is about to get really good in Christ. But there's no promise here of this at any level for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. But to those whom God does give a blessedness of resources, it is always, when God does it, it's always for God's glory and not for man's pleasures. Verse 
20, the second of the two if-then statements. So first is if you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. You will be satisfied. You will not be in want. You will not, you will not, you will not feel at any level as though God's being unfair. It'll be the best. It'll be the, the best time of your life, even while suffering, because it is in Christ and it is in God. But if you refuse and rebel you will be devoured by the sword. So the high king of heaven has brought you into his court and he's reasoning with you. He's showing you the evidence and the proof. He will give you eyes to see or he will cover your eyes and you will refuse. Everything in the, in the courtroom of Almighty God is ruled by his sovereign hand. If you refuse... Can, can you imagine, would there be anything of any person who comes and sees the righteous hand of God, that God is here, He's covered you, He's covered your sins, He's prepared, He's, He's in place to cover your sins, and there's no doubt you are a sinner. And the only thing, there's only one of two things that are going to happen now. You're going to face the wrath of God, or God's going to cover you with His own Son's blood and declare you white as snow and put His own righteousness upon your life. You have one of two responses here. You can consent and obey, or you can refuse and rebel. Now you who have consented and obeyed, you would think who in their right mind would ever refuse and rebel? Would any human ever seeing their condition refuse God's provision? But unless God opens their eyes, they hate God's provision. They will refuse. And they will rebel. And they will be held guilty as charged and will be devoured by their passions. They will be devoured by that which they want to take aggression against. They will, come, they will succumb to the same thing that drives them. They will be devoured. And the last thing that Isaiah says in the, in the words that we're observing here in verse 20 is truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Verse 10, it is here the word of the Lord. Give ear to his instructions. Verse 20, truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. But God is able to save, we know this. And he's able to save, as the King James puts it, he's able to save to the uttermost. You. No, perhaps Acts 1.8 well enough. As, as Jesus is telling His disciples to wait until the Spirit of God comes upon them. And when the Spirit of God comes upon them, they are to be His witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost. To the, to the far reaches of the world. God is able to save to the uttermost. He is able and He does this. It is His work it is His duty that He's given to His church to be an advancer of this gospel in our day. He's called us to wash ourselves and to make ourselves clean. He's called us in this day to re remove the evil deeds that we do from His sight. He has called us to cease to do evil. He's called us to learn to do good. He's called us to seek justice. He's called us to reprove the ruthless. He's called us to defend the orphan. He's called us to plead for the widow. And then He's shown us the only way you're going to be able to do this is when I put my righteousness upon you and I cover you because your hands are guilty. They're covered with blood. The blood of idolatry, the, the blood of covetousness, the blood of everything that is opposed to God. Will, will you not? 
Will you not come into the courtroom with me? There's one more thing that's in this courtroom scene when he says, come and let us reason. There is this Redeemer. There is this Jesus. There is this Son of the Most High God. Can I, can I say to you, do not take your eyes off of this Jesus. Do not take your eyes off of this Redeemer when you're in this courtroom. Yeah, you'll be shocked and you'll, 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 you'll see the vileness of your sin and you'll see the preciousness of this covering. You'll see the chart and you'll see and you'll hope and wonder how would it be possible that I could be clean. Well, don't take your eyes off of, off of Jesus. When you've come and you've looked at this cross, you see this is an empty cross. This is a living Jesus. Look, there, look on that cross and there you'll see, there, that's your sin. Don't take your eyes off too quickly from that cross because you'll also see standing next to that cross your Redeemer. Don't take your eyes off of that cross too quickly. Don't take your eyes off of this and let, them, let your eyes sit back into the, the apathetic routine of your life. Don't take your eyes off of this cross stained with the blood of your Redeemer. Leave your eyes fixed upon this captain of your life. Do not take your eyes off of that cross. Look at that chart again. Here is your judgment. Don't take your eyes off of that cross. Don't take your eyes off of this Savior. See what He's done for you. If right now you're feeling pricked by the Word of God, it's not in your own reasoning. It's because the High King of glory, He's put His Spirit to work and He's opened your eyes and He's opened your ears and He's called you to repentance. Why walk away? Why step away? Why refuse? Why rebel? No, today. Repent and be saved.